Good afternoon. Welcome to the course, Study of Galt's Speech. A couple of procedural matters first. You all should have had two handouts. One's the course outline, which I'll get to in a few moments. And the other one is an outline of Galt's speech that I've made with its structure. I've divided it into parts and sections. Now the page numbers, if you look, for instance, the introduction says pages 117 to 120. The page numbering refers to for the new intellectual, because the page numbering there is constant through the additions. And the, I've numbered all the paragraphs. There's 296 paragraphs in Galt's speech. And then I've broken it up into sections. And we'll get to, I mean, this is going to be a major focus of the course, looking at the structure of the speech. But uh, we'll really start getting into that in the second lecture. Now, if you're using Atlas instead of for the new intellectual, you might want to number the paragraphs in Atlas to have an idea. I mean, you don't have to number all 296, like number 1, 10, 20, something like that. So it'll be easier to follow around uh, along if you have Atlas. And it might be a good idea to read through my structure um, as we're getting to each part. Uh, as I say, that will start in lecture two, the major focus on the logical structure of Galt's speech. So you'll have time to do a bit of homework and do that reading. Because it'll make it easier to follow along what I'm saying if you've read a little bit. Uh, and on the back, I've put, this is the um, essentialized outline without the paragraphs and so. OK, so we'll be bringing this with you to class every day because we'll be making use of it. OK, so that's for the handouts. Now, for questions, I've had a tendency in the past to get distracted by questions. So I'm going to try to uh, only take questions when I get to pauses in the material and see how that goes. If I'm still getting distracted, I might leave questions till the end of each lecture, so each uh, period. OK, that's enough for procedural stuff. Now, there's two, I have two goals in this course. One is to connect Galt's speech with Atlas Shrugged. So to try to identify its place in Atlas Shrugged, to define its purpose in the story. So that's one goal. And the second goal is to analyze the structure of Galt's speech. Um, as I said, we'll get into that starting in class two. And so that's going to be the bulk of our time, looking at the structure of the speech, because I think that's inherently more difficult than defining its place in Atlas. Um, and as we're going through the speech, we're going to pause at selected points in the speech to connect the points to Atlas. So we'll ask questions like, how is this point illustrated in the novel? Or how does this point help us understand a certain character or event in the novel? Or how does the novel give us some inductive data for really understanding the principle? So we'll, we'll make those pauses as we go through the speech. And uh, I don't know who's read the book, um, Who is Ayn Rand by the Brandons. But in there, she makes, uh, Barbara Brandon makes a point that Galt's speech doesn't contain one idea that's not dramatized in Atlas. And we'll kind of try. We obviously can't go through every point. Uh, I mean, we'd be here until next conference. But uh, I'm going to take a couple difficult points and on, on the premise that if we can show how those points are illustrated in Atlas, then it's probably a safe bet that uh, the other points are going to be illustrated there, too. OK, so that's for the two goals of the course. Now, you might ask, well, why study Galt's speech in this way? Now, I mean, it's basically the basic answer is to get a better understanding of both Atlas and objectivism, which I'm assuming are goals of everybody here. So I don't think a lot of motivation is needed to launch the course. But I want to just say a few things in way of motivation. So for the first goal of trying to connect Galt's speech to Atlas, well, I think the role of the speech is not obvious to the reader, or it's often not obvious. So for instance, uh, I've met many people who, who like the book and who later become objectivists um, who skip the speech on a first reading. Uh, so they're too excited, they want to get to the end, they want to see how uh, the story turns out. But obviously there's an implicit premise there that you can skip the speech and still understand the ending. Um, and I don't think that's true. And even for people who, after they've read Galt's speech, I would ask them certain questions such as, 
uh, well, what is Galt's purpose in giving the speech? Why does he get on the radio and announce the strike? And they would have difficulty, people would have difficulty answering that question. Or I would ask, who is Galt addressing when he gives the speech? And I'd get answers like he's addressing the looters, which I don't think is true. Or that he's addressing Dagny primarily, or, and other remaining heroes uh, who are still trapped in the world. And I don't think that's true either. Um, so, so I'm proceeding on the premise that it's not obvious uh, exactly what the role of the speech is and why Galt decides to get on the radio and give it. So that's for the first goal of the course. For the second goal of analyzing its logical structure, well, let me say this, that the speech is long. It, I mean, it's some 57, 60 pages in the novel. And it's, to understate the point, it's packed with insight. There's an enormous amount of content there. <clears throat> so. It, it's easy to, um, to, to focus very narrowly on the speech and focus on one particular paragraph or one point that Galt is making in the speech and fail to see the speech as a total, to see its overall structure, its overall logic. Uh, and that's what my goal is in analyzing the speech, to see it as a, a connected, a long progression of an argument. <clears throat> and in order to see that, what we need to do is analyze the speech, break it into parts, to see what uh, point he's making, to understand the transition among the points, and then to, after we've broken it into parts, to reintegrate it uh, and to see it as a total. So I think in, in the name of understanding the speech better, that's what we have to do. You need that kind of analysis. So if you go to the course outline, what I'm setting out to do, I hope to get through uh, one and two, at least the bulk of point two of connecting the speech with Atlas in this class. And then the remaining four classes will be looking at the speech. And I think there are three major parts to the speech. And um, so I think we'll get through part one towards the third, third class. Part two, we should be finished by the fourth class, and part three will be for the fifth class. OK, that's in way of what I'm setting out to do, the handouts. Are there any questions about any of that? OK. Now, before we really begin to discuss the role of speech in the novel, I think it's useful to remind ourselves of the theme and the plot theme of Atlas. I assume everyone's familiar with this, so I just want to state these two uh, idea. So the theme of Atlas is what? Sorry, what? I didn't catch that. The theme is, yeah, what would you, how would you put the theme? Of? Yeah, that's more the plot, the plot theme of, of translating that abstract meaning into, into action. That's the first transition. So that's like the essence of the action, uh, the men of the mind going on strike. But the theme, so what does that illustrate? Yeah, the role of the mind in existence, right. Um, so it's the theme of Atlas is demonstrating the role of the mind in existence, that the mind or that reason is the tool of survival. And then the plot theme of translating that theme into action is the idea of the men of the mind going on strike. And Having the theme of Atlas, uh, the reason I wanted to state it, because we'll see that uh, it's important in trying to understand the speech to understand that that's the theme of Atlas. And for the plot theme, it's important to understand that the novel is an, essentially a novel about a strike um, if you want to understand why Galt's giving his speech. OK, so let's now turn to the question of trying to explicitly define the role of the speech in the novel. Galt's basic purpose or purposes in giving the speech. And so a logical question to begin with, an obvious question, is to ask, well, why does Galt go on the radio and give a speech? Why does he reveal the strike of the men of the mind uh, to the nation and to the world? Right? The reader already knows about the strike, because the reader's seen the valley through Dagny crashing into it. 
Um, so the reader knows about the strike, but why does Galt get on the radio and announce it to the world? And why does he announce it at the point he does in the novel? Why not earlier, for instance? Why not when he sets out on his strike and he enlists Francisco and Ragnar? Why not announce it then that the men in the mind are going to be going on strike? <clears throat> so these are the two overall questions that I kind of want to look at in order to get at the basic uh, purpose of the speech in the novel. And obviously, the first question is the more fundamental question. Why does Galt even give the speech? And it's a derivative question to ask, well, why does he give the speech when he does give it? <clears throat> OK, so let's start with the more fundamental question and then look at the derivative question. So why does he go on the radio and announce the strike? Because at this point in the novel, the, it's clear that the looters' state and the looters themselves are going to collapse and die. <clears throat> the, the, the world, the nation in the world has passed the point of no return. So no, why not just let the looters collapse and die? What's his purpose in giving the speech? Does anyone want to hazard it? Sure, Alan? To show people an alternative that they don't have just passively accept that. Um, put it into words explicitly. To show him an alternative in order for what? I mean, why does he want to tell them there's an alternative? So that the better people will fight to get rid of the leaders and make and the And so what do they have to do, the better people, to fight? To not sanction the leaders. Yeah, to go on strike. OK. Yeah, I think that's one of the major goals, to, to convince the people in the, in the nation and throughout the world that uh, they need to go on strike. Um, I think there's a second purpose that Galt has, sure. Yeah. Proper blame. What, what would be the purpose of that? Well, for instance, currently people tend to blame capitalism for ills rather than the absence of capitalism. This case would be to assign the blame to where it's due. There's something I think to that. I think there's a more there's a more positive way of looking at that point. Ed, isn't the wider principle to help people understand the causes of what's happening? Um, really understand <coughs> right. What the cause was, which is really a moral issue, the moral cause. Right. Um, yeah, and that goes into, into the first point, that to get them to go on strike, they have to understand why they would go on strike. Um, sure. I think a more positive message is the means of recovery of, for establishing a healthy and happy life worldwide. Um, yeah, I think that's part of, he wants them to go on strike, and he wants them to do something more. Um, so he wants, I'll get to that, that the, the something more. Um, I think it's also an issue of justice, of um, to give an objective statement to the better people who are trying to understand what the hell happened to the world um, and what they can do about it now. It's an issue of justice to those people to try to explain to them what the cause of the collapse is and what they could do about it if they're sincerely trying to do something about it. So Galt's not, if you ask, well, who is he addressing in the speech? He's not addressing the looters. Because there would be no point, he would have no purpose in addressing the looters. And what would he be trying to say to them? Would he be trying to tell them, well, uh, to point out their errors and say, well, these are the errors of your ways. You need to change. Um, it, sure. I was suggest that um, in the speech, one of the purposes might be addressing the looters to the them. But they're going to collapse. It's going to. Regardless of Galt getting on the radio, he's, got, he's enlisted enough minds to go on strike. I mean, he's got Reardon, Daniger, Wyatt, etc. That the world's going to collapse. So I don't think um, he would have, there would be any purpose in telling him, well, you're going to die. I mean, they're going to die. So. And to, if he were addressing them, that would presuppose that, one, they have minds, which they don't. And two, that they would, they're interested in living, which they aren't. Um, so he can have no purpose in addressing the looters. Now what about, would he, is he primarily addressing Dagny? 
Well, again, no, I don't think he is. Um, it's true that if you look at the, uh, towards the end of the speech, this is on page uh, 191, he says, the last of my words will be addressed to those heroes who might still be hidden in the world, those who are held prisoner, not by their evasions, but by their virtue and their desperate courage. And he talks a little bit uh, at the end there, that he, it's obvious he's talking to Dagny. Um, but notice, he says, the last of my words. This is on the second last page of the speech. So that means the bulk of the, of the speech is not addressed to uh, the heroes remaining in the world. I mean, if you wanted to talk to Dagny, you could just do it in private. He doesn't have to get on the radio. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so I think there are two purposes. One, it's an issue of justice to explain what has happened to the people who are genuinely now trying to understand what has happened. And then an issue of um, it's in the selfish interest of the strikers to try to get uh, the, the better people in the, in the world to go on strike, to join them in the strike. Um, and, and talking about it as an issue of uh, justice to explain um, why they've gone on strike and why he's called a strike, it's, uh, you could compare it to what Jefferson says at the start of the Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, I wanted to bring in the Declaration since we're so close to the Independence Day. Um, this is what Galt says about uh, this issue of it being a, uh, an issue of justice to give, an, give a clear statement of what he's done. Um, this is on page 188, paragraph 282. Um, this is what Galt says, quote, I'm speaking to those among you who have retained some sovereign shred of their soul, unsold and unstamped to the order of others. If, in the chaos of the motives that have made you listen to the radio tonight, there was an honest, rational desire to learn what is wrong with the world, you are the man whom I wish to address. By the rules and terms of my code, one owes a rational statement to those whom it does concern and who are making an effort to know. Those who are making an effort to fail to understand me are not a concern of mine. Close quote. <clears throat> so it's part of his code, part of justice, to give an objective statement uh, of when, I mean, he's taken a major action and he's turned their world upside down. And he's going to explain to, to the people who still have some element of rationality why he's done that. And this is now to quote from the start of the declaration. Uh, quote, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect for the sorry, to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. <clears throat> so I think it's a, I mean, it's, a, it's a kind of similar situation in that the founding fathers were um, launching a tremendous revolution as Galt is doing. And it's a, it's a similar uh, idea of explaining what they've done. OK, so that's for the issue of justice. <clears throat> On the issue of trying to get them to strike, uh, I think there are two, two things he's trying to do. He's trying to convince them to go on strike. Because that, the world's going to collapse. The looter's state is going to collapse. And at some point in the future, the strikers will be able to return to the world. But the strikers are in love with the world. And they want to return as soon as they can. So the sooner the looter state collapses, the better. So if they can get people to go on strike, that, that could uh, I mean, hasten the collapse by 10, 20 years. Who knows? Uh, so that's one purpose. And then when they return to the world, it would be uh, a lot easier to rebuild if there are some rational people that they can deal with. There are some rational groups that they can uh, link up with and combine. As compared to um, the world just descending into a state of savagery, of anarchy, of these warring gangs and factions. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that they need, that the strikers need um, the common people to go on strike in order to achieve their goals. No, the state will collapse and they'll be able to rebuild whether or not there are these hordes of savages roaming around. But it will, 
going on strike will hasten the collapse and the rebuilding will be easier. It won't be impossible without the help of the common people, but it will be easier. Um, so if you, can, if you can convince them to go on strike and to assume uh, the virtue of rationality and the derivative virtues, to get onto the code of life, the morality of life, that will be of benefit to all the strikers. So as Galt puts it, um, <clears throat> here this is Galt urging them to strike. This is on page 189. He says, if you find a chance to vanish into some wilderness out of their reach, do so. And then this is um, where he's telling them what to do when they do strike. Uh, this is the next paragraph, 286 on 189. He says, act as a rational being and aim at becoming a rallying point for all those who, have, who are starved for a voice of integrity. Act on your rational values, whether alone in the midst of your enemies or with a few of your chosen friends or as the founder of a modest community on the frontier of mankind's rebirth. <clears throat> and then he says um, that, that the, the looters, uh, sorry, the, the, the men of the mind, basically Galt's Gulch, will become like a rallying center. Um, this is on page 190. He says, we will open the gates of our city to those who deserve to enter. A city of smokestacks, pipelines, orchids, markets, and inviolate homes. We will act as the rallying center for such hidden, hidden outposts as you'll build. And then skipping a bit, he says, those who choose to join us will join us. Those who don't will not have the power to stop us. Hordes of savages have never been an obstacle to men who carried the banner of the mind." <clears throat> Close quote. So you can think what he's suggesting, uh, you can think of it in these terms, in terms of the colonization of North America. It, w when the Europeans came here, it would have been uh, easier for them if there were no Indians. Or if there were, I mean, given that there were Indians, if the Indians actually joined them and recognized the values uh, that they were bringing to the New World and helped in rebuilding the New World. It wasn't an insurmountable obstacle that there were these savages here, but it would have been, would have been preferable for the Europeans had there not been. Um, and so that's what Galt's trying to do in uh, convincing them to strike and then to, to uh, form rational communities. Okay, that's basically what I wanted to say on Galt's uh, overall purpose in giving the strike. I think there are, there are those two factors. Um, so let me pause here before going on to the, the more derivative question of why he gives the, the, the speech when he does in the novel to see if there are any questions so far about what's been said. Nothing? Okay. Let's then move to the, the more derivative question of why he gives the speech when he does uh, in the novel. Why doesn't he give it earlier, earlier on in the strike? Who has some suggestions about? Uh, sure. Pardon? But I mean, the way it's portrayed in the book is that Galt has the technical means that he could go on the radio when he wanted. So why, at the specific point, I mean, he's, it's true that he's preempting his broadcast, but why not have announced the strike earlier? It's already been announced in Thompson. Yeah, I think that's looking too narrowly to, I mean, I think there are other reasons than just that. Yeah? People already, it has to be at a point in time where there's plenty of evidence of how disastrous things are, and the people can connect them that there's something missing. You know, before, um, before things get too bad, people, you know, it's not going to be as perceptually clear that there really is a huge problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think you so. have to connect it with the, it's the men of the mind that are that's the cause of the the lack of thing, you know. Right. Like yeah, I think that's that's one reason, and there's another reason. I think. I mean, I'll get I'll deal with that a little bit, but uh, I think there's another major reason. Anybody? Uh, they talk about how um, it was dangerous for Galt to go back into the outside world at that point because things were about to collapse. Right. And um, before then, it was safe enough for uh, him and Francisco and others to go around and recruit the men of the mine um, in a relatively safe world. But now, now it's becoming too dangerous, and they can only do it over the broadcast. Like that. Yeah, I think that's along the right lines. I'd put it a little differently than that. Um, but yeah, OK, let me go 
Um, so I think we've got hit at the two, two major reasons. Why not earlier? Um, so what Dina said about the, the c having the uh, evidence for um, the meaning of the strike before them. So they see the world collapsing. They have a knowledge that all these great industrialists are vanishing. They don't know they're on strike, but they, they, the people of the world and, uh, have seen that they're disappearing. And even the looters are trying to chain reared into his mills and so on, so that he doesn't vanish as well. Um, that's just prior to Galt going on the radio. And I think the point is this. If Galt, when he started the strike, said, OK, the men of the mind are going on strike, what would people's reaction be? Who cares? <clears throat> and that's a basic point in the story, that the men of the mind, uh, there's a kind of dual perspective that the looters and um, through them the common people who have learned the looters' moral code have on the men of the mind. They blank them out uh, and they evade their existence because they stand as, to, to the looters they stand as a reproach. And the whole of the looters' doctrine is premised on the non-existence of the men of the mind. <clears throat> but the looters also know uh, that they're counting on the men of the mind. So there's this kind of dual nature. But for the people of the world, if, if the Gaul told them 10 years before, you, we're going on strike, they would just say, who cares? And, uh, but at the point in the story where everything's crumbling and they see uh, their, I mean, the whole world cr cr crumbling, they see a lack of food, a, a lack of all the basic necessities. And now when Galt tells them that the mind is on strike, and that's the, the cause of the collapse of the world, they care. <clears throat> so that's one reason. And I think this, a second major reason is along the lines uh, of the point here that um, it, 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 it was safe for Galt and Francisco and so on to be in the world before and it's no longer uh, safe now. But I would put it like this, that in announcing the strike, Galt knows that the looters will be coming after the men of the mine. They're going to try to shackle them to make them produce. And really, Galt knows that, I mean, that their desire is to kill the men of the mine. So they will come after them when they realize uh, that they are on strike and they're, they're around somewhere to be found. So it's an issue of self-preservation for Galt and the other strikers that he announced the strike only when uh, they're isolated, where, where they're removed from the world and out of the looters' reach. So if you remember uh, th through the story, the valley starts off as uh, Midas Mulligan's valley. And it's not anywhere close to self-sufficient when the strike uh, starts. Basically, the, the, the strikers start going there once a month which means for 11 months of the year, they're still in the world. And Sorry, pardon. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, once a year. They, they go for a month once a year. Um, and so that means 11 months of the year, they're in the world and easy prey for the looters if the looters actually start looking for them. Um, but towards the, towards the end, the valleys become self-sufficient, and all the strikers can stay there indefinitely. And you'll notice that uh, Galt gives the speech only when he gets the last of uh, the people he wants to catch. So he, gets, uh, he announces a speech when they get reared. And there's only Dagny remaining after that, but she's chosen to remain. Um, <clears throat> so I think those are the two uh, main reasons why he gives the strike, uh, sorry, gives the speech only when he does. OK, that's what I had for the derivative questions. Are there any uh, questions on that before we proceed uh, to other material? OK, so we've got an idea of why his basic purpose is in giving the speech and why he gives the speech when he does in the novel. <clears throat> now I want to look, uh, having what his basic purposes are in giving the speech, will give us uh, a lead to the three, I think, that, as I said, I think the speech is divided into three parts. And understanding his purpose, or purposes, in giving the speech, uh, you can see how the basic structure of the speech flows out of his purposes. So I think there are three, as I said, three parts. Uh, part one I call the morality of life. So he's stating what the morality of life, what the code of the producers 
is. <clears throat> and that, uh, if you go to the, my handout, that's pages 120 to 136 in the For the New Intellectual. And then I think the second part is stating the morality of death, the code of the looters. And I have that as pages 136 to 164. And then I have as the third part um, that he's telling the people of the nation and the world that their choice is either the morality of life or the morality of death. And that's pages uh, 164 to the end. And if you want to condense the, the, the last section, you could say, well, part one's the morality of life, part two is the morality of death, part three is choose. <clears throat> um, and if you, if you notice uh, in my structure, I've, I've put the first few, uh, first, I guess, three or four pages as introductory, as, a, as an overall introduction to the speech. And it's basically, he's setting out that these will be uh, its three major parts, its, its focus. And I think for both, we said the purposes in giving the speech are uh, that it's an issue of justice to give an objective statement of what Galt has done and why, how he's caused uh, the collapse of the world and why he's done that. <clears throat> and, and we said that the, the other purpose is um, to, to convince people to go on strike. And if we look at each of these in turn, I think we'll see why those three parts are needed in the speech. So if you take the first one as, a, as an issue of justice, of giving an objective statement. <clears throat> well, what has happened to the world? Uh, why is it collapsed? Well, Galt tells them that it's because their morality has been fully achieved and that their morality is uh, a morality of death. It can lead only to destruction and death. So to explain that, you would have to explain what the morality, their moral code is and why, in essence, it's a morality of death. To explain why when their moral code comes to full fruition, the result is destruction and death. And why are they on strike? What are they in strike, uh, on strike in the name of? Well, they're on strike in the name of a different moral code. <clears throat> they're on strike in the name of Galt's moral code. So he's going to have to state what that code is and explain what that is. As Galt says in what I'm calling the introduction, this is a page 118, paragraph number seven, he says, talking about the strikers, quote, I showed them to, the way to live by another morality, mine. It is mine they chose to follow. So he's going to have to explain what that other morality is in order to, to give an objective explanation of the strike and why they're on strike. And then to the, to the, the better semi-rational people who he's addressing, and he's addressing their better side, whatever element of rationality or goodness is left in their souls. To those who are still making an attempt to, to understand what has happened to the world and then to do something about it. Well, he's going to have to tell them what they have to do, <clears throat> and that's to go on strike. And that's what he's telling them in the third part. So you can see how the three parts fit into that purpose in stating, giving an objective statement as a matter of justice to the better people left in the world. Now, if you think in terms of trying to convince them to go on strike, well, what would he have to tell them to convince them to go on strike? Well, he would have to tell them that there's another way to live than the way they've been half living. <clears throat> he would have to tell them there is a morality of life. <clears throat> As he tells them uh, in, in still what I'm calling the introduction, he says what you need is not to return to morality, but to discover it. Well, he's going to have to show them uh, what is, in fact, morality. He also has to show them that their destruction is, it's not an inevitable if they remain, uh, if they choose the morality of life, which he's going to explain to them. But these are the, he calls these people the semi-rational. So they kind of half accept the codes and doctrines of the mystics. And he has to explain to them that if, if that's the way they're trying to live, then that now means destruction and death. And it means destruction and death because 
Galtz uh, identified the way in which um, evil propagates itself. And he's grasped the principle of the sanction of the victim. And he's gotten all the men of the mind to uh, withdraw their sanction. And that's the way that these uh, half-rational, half-irrational uh, people have been living. <clears throat> and that now, I mean, the, if you want, the middle ground has been removed. And they're either going to fall on the side of the looters and so perish, or else they can uh, try to understand what the morality of life is and then choose it. <clears throat> and so that's what he, in part three, that's what he's going to, he's going to tell them. He, they have to choose one or the other. And now you might ask, uh, I mean, this, this question occurred to me. Part, uh, what I'm calling part three, uh, which I think starts on page 164, it's about 30 pages of um, the speech in, in the for, for the new intellectual. Now, why would you need 30 pages to explain to them, well, you have to choose the morality of life and not the morality of death? I mean, he's already, the way, I've, the, way the, the speech is structured, he presents the morality of life, then he presents the morality of death, and then he's going to tell them to choose. Now, it seems pretty obvious what the choice should be. Um, that you should choose the morality of life and uh, throw out the mystics and the looters. So why do you need 30 pages to, uh, to, to try to convince them or persuade them of that? And I, I think uh, what Galt tells us in that section, are there, that there are deep reasons, and we'll get to this when we get to part three, that there are deep reasons why these um, semi-rational people who have half accepted the, the morality of death. <clears throat> why, there, there are deep reasons why they're always attracted to the middle of the road to compromise. And so even when they hear of, that there is this morality of life and they, they get the essence of what uh, the code they've been half following is and that it's a morality of death, they're still scared to make a choice. <clears throat> they're still scared to commit themselves to one extreme. And there, there are deep reasons that Galt gets into of why that's so. Um, why, um, I mean, we'll get into this, but it, about how their concept of morality makes it such that uh, they're always scared of extremes and why they're, why they're scared of rejecting the morality of death, even when they see that it is the morality of death. So he needs to get into a lot of material there. It's, for, for a rational person, like Reardon, when he hears what the morality of life is, I mean, he's gone. <clears throat> but that's not true for these semi-rational people. OK, so that, that's what I think the three major parts are of uh, the speech. And that's what we'll be looking at in more detail, breaking that down uh, in further classes. But are there any questions about that, that overall structure? Is that pretty clear? OK, we have about, uh, about half an hour left. Yep. Can you compare the structure of the speech with the structure of the whole novel, like the main reflection of the structure of the whole novel? I'm not. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I don't have much to add to that. Though. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. What I want to do. Um, in the time remaining, is we've got the, um, the God's basic purpose in giving the speech. And so we've got the, the basic essential connection of the speech to Atlas um, and its role in the story and in the plot. In the, in the remaining time today, what I wanted to do was look at other contributions of God's speech, other ways in which it's connected to Atlas, um, other ways in which it's an integral part of the novel. <clears throat> and I think the easiest way to, to think of this and to stimulate your mind is to ask, well, what if the speech wasn't in the novel? <clears throat> in what ways would it be lacking? In what ways would it be a defect not to have the speech in the novel? And now here, I'm just going to make a few observations, a few different points. I don't mean this as an exhaustive list of the connections. And it's not in, uh, I haven't really put this in any uh, 
order. So I'm, it's just a, a, a few observations of ways in which um, Galt's speech is uh, an integral part of the novel. <clears throat> so the, my first point, um, you need the speech to, to understand the subsequent events, the climax and the torture scene in Atlas Shrugged. <clears throat> Without Galt's speech, it wouldn't be fully intelligible why the looters want uh, to catch him and to make him economic dictator, because that's what they want to do, and why they are trying to torture him to become economic dictator. I mean, the reason they're looking for him is because they've heard the speech. <clears throat> now, of course, they try to blank out Galt and the speech. If you remember uh, Mr. Thompson's thought, or, or I mean, he says it out loud, right after the speech. He says, it wasn't real, was it? <clears throat> so, I mean, and this is what, I mean, they're always evading and blanking out. Um, and so, and this is what their view, I mean, this is their dual approach to the men of the mind. They always blank them out, but they secretly count on them. And it's, again, the secret knowledge that they've heard the speech, and they know that Galt is the preeminent man of the mind. And that he knows what's wrong with the country. And he's, he's a person who gets things done. I mean, that's the reason they're looking for him. So without the speech, um, I mean, they wouldn't know about his existence. They wouldn't be looking for him. And they wouldn't be trying to make him economic dictator. But they know, I mean, they have to know they're through um, if they don't get Galt's, uh, Galt's knowledge and Galt's actions uh, through trying to convince him or through torturing him. And in the torture scene, um, and uh, when Galt is caught by the looters, his actions wouldn't be fully intelligible if, he, if we didn't already have the knowledge that we know he knows in that because he's given the speech. So uh, he doesn't cooperate with them. <clears throat> and he doesn't, he doesn't do anything. I mean, he knows that there's no way to figure out uh, how an economic dictator could get the country moving, that there's no way to get a mind to work by force. And so, I mean, he, he does nothing because he can't do anything. And he doesn't volunteer anything because he, he's grasped the principle of the sanction of the victim. And he knows that that's what the looters are counting on, and that's what, what he will not give them. And so those actions to the reader would not be in, intelligible. You wouldn't understand them unless you knew that Galt has the knowledge that he does. And you know that because of the speech. <clears throat> So I think that's one connection. <laughs> uh, I think that's one, uh, another way in which the spe speech is uh, an integral part of Atlas. <clears throat> okay, so that's one point. Uh, any questions on that before we move to the second point? Okay, a second point. <clears throat> it's been said, and, and rightly, that uh, Atlas Shrugged is a murder mystery. It's a, it's a story about the death and the rebirth of man's soul. And it is, I mean, it is a mystery. It is a murder mystery. Now, it would be bizarre to have a murder mystery where the murderer is not revealed, and you don't get his means, motive, and opportunity. And yet, that's what we get. That's what Galt gives us in the speech. He reveals himself as the murderer. So in the speech, we get Galt's means, motive, and opportunity in committing the murder and destroying the world and preparing it for the rebirth of man. So we get his motive, which is to free the men of the mind from their self-created prison, to let evil perish from its own impotence, and then to return and reclaim the world. That's what he's after. We get his means, which is by withdrawing the men of the mind, convincing them to strike, and we get the knowledge that he needed in order uh, to be in possession of those means. So we get that he's grasped the nature of good and evil, that he's grasped the potency of the good and the impotency of evil. He's grasped the principle of the sanction of the victim. And then he's put all that knowledge into action by getting the men of the mind to go on strike. And we get his opportunity. And basically, anyone had the opportunity to do what Galt did if they had the means. 
So we get all that in the speech. And just like you would expect that in a normal murder mystery, you expect that in Atlas Shrugged. OK, so that's the second, uh, a second connection. Any questions on that before we go to a third? OK, a third. Uh, and this is kind of related to the, the point I just made. Galt's speech makes explicit, crucial action uh, in the novel that was only implicit before. And I take this that this is a, a, an aesthetic principle, that a novelist should dramatize crucial action and not just kind of refer to it uh, after the fact and so on, or by its effects and so on. So if you think, how has Galt been pulling all these men of the mind out? Well, it's basically by telling them what he's uh, setting out in the speech, what he's telling the nation and the world is what he told them in essence. And that's how he gets them to go on strike. They have to recognize that they're the good. They have to recognize the full evil of the, the evil that they're up against. And they have to recognize that the only way to combat that evil is to strike. <clears throat> and that's what we get in the speech. So it makes all, I mean, if you, if you remember uh, Dagny's kind of following Galt's trail of destruction, of pulling out the men of the mind. And you see, uh, the clearest example you see is when she enters Daniger's office and Galt's leaving out the other door. Um, but that's all, that's, it's crucial action to what the whole novel, and yet it's kind of left to implication and, and the consequence and so on. And that had to become explicit, I think, at some point in the novel. And so we get that in Galt's speech. Now, a, a point related to that is you can see the speech as itself a dramatization of the theme of the novel. So we said the theme of the novel is the mind in man's existence, <clears throat> and that, it, that reason is the tool of survival, that it's knowledge that he needs in order to live. And the speech dramatizes that, because what did the, the men of the mind, uh, people like Reardon and Daniger and Wyatt, what did they need in order to uh, succeed fully, to not, be, to, to, to not be penalized for their virtues, and so on, <clears throat> to be able to achieve their life and happiness fully? Well, they needed the knowledge that is contained in the speech. It's John Galt's thinking that makes possible their liberation, as well as Galt's own liberation. So we see um, through the speech that it's this knowledge that allowed uh, the men of the mind to uh, achieve full goodness and achieve all their values. So that the speech itself dramatizes the way in which you need knowledge in order to achieve your values, your happiness, your life. Okay, and the last, I mean, I think that's fairly clear. A last uh, observation about the connection. The speech serves... Uh, uh, an important role, I think, in dramatizing Galt's character. So the, the speech is an enormous aid in dramatizing his character. Now, Galt is rationality impersonated. Or you could say that deeper, he's the mind impersonated. And it's the theoretical and practical mind integrated together. It's, it's a mind of genius that is both theoretical and practical. You see that vividly uh, in terms of the motor, right? He discovers a revolutionary new concept of energy, so we get the theory, uh, and then he translates that into a practical application, the motor. So it's, it's a, a mind of genius that operates both in terms of theory and practice. Now, as useful as the motor is, it's still, uh, it has an element, I mean, necessarily, it has an element of science fiction to it. Because you don't know what the new concept of energy uh, Galt has discovered, or how the motor works, and so on. You can only, you have to infer that um, by thinking of discoveries and inventions you know about. So you can think of Newton's great discoveries in physics, and Edison as, uh, a great inventor, and you put those together, and that's what Galt has done with the motor. But I think Galt's speech plays a similar role to the motor in uh, dramatizing Galt's intelligence and, I mean, his level of genius. Uh, 
So I think it, it literally has the same, uh, I mean, the same role as the motor. Galt's speech is, uh, is, is a concrete, if you will, in, in the way that the motor is. You can look at it this way, that the speech is a product of genius. <clears throat> and it's put, in, uh, it, it's put in the novel to show us that Galt is a genius. And so whereas the motor, you kind of have to infer the steps and what it's all about, the speech is itself a product of genius. And you can see fully uh, the reasons and the causes of why it is uh, a product of genius. Philosophical ideas are available to anyone, to any reader to understand. They don't require technical knowledge. Um, so any reader can see that this is a product, I mean any rational reader, discerning reader, can see that this is a product of genius, that only a genius could create the speech. <clears throat> and it's put in, uh, in terms, uh, in the novel to, to dramatize Galt's genius. So, I mean, it, I think that's an incredible achievement on Ayn Rand's part. I, it, it would be hard to imagine a, another novel, a novel of genius. So you would need a writer who's a genius and who's also uh, a genius in another field. Uh, so Ayn Rand is a genius in terms of her aesthetics and her, of her writing. She's also a genius in terms of her philosophical ability. And she puts that in the novel to dramatize a genius. I mean, you would, it's, it's, I mean, it's hard to imagine that being done again. Um, so, so I think that's another major connection to it. I mean, how else could you convince us that Galt's a genius but to put a product of genius in the novel and say, well, this is what Galt came up with. Okay, so that's, let me see if I have, well, I mean, you would need, I'll make this point since we have a bit of time. Um, you would need, it would have to be something like this. I was thinking, well, what could be a situation that would be something like this? I was thinking, well, take in the 19th century, the discovery, uh, Darwin's discovery of the theory of evolution, um, which I take it is, you don't need that much technical knowledge to understand that. <clears throat> so what Darwin would have to do is he would have to be the discoverer of that theory. Then he would have to uh, first present it in a novel. And the novel would have to be one where, uh, I mean, it's centered around that, uh, the whole plot is centered around the discovery of this knowledge, the discovery of the theory of evolution. And then it's first presented in the novel. And I mean, who could do it but Ayn Rand? Okay, so that's what I had uh, in terms of other connections of Galt's speech to the novel. So let me pause here um, and ask her if there are any questions about any of that. Or any, I mean, any other connections you want to talk about? Or, yep. Oh, sorry. What about the length of the speech in terms of? I mean, I've heard, you know, Ayn Rand has, I, I think, said that you know, every word of that is necessary. And I don't disagree, but it's, you know, it's very long. Um, Does it have to be as long um, in terms of all that you're talking about? Yeah, I think it. you get, I mean, in one sense it's long, but in one sense it's highly condensed. Um, and uh, I think to, to really present what the, the morality of life is, to, so that people can make a reasoned choice between uh, the morality of life and the morality of death, it has to be as long as it is in the speech. You could present certain ideas and so on, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't convince um, someone without the, the detail that is in the speech. So I think that this the length is necessary. Um, and as we'll, as we go through the structure, I think we'll see um, why why each why each major point is there and why it needs to be there in order to uh, be able to to, to convince people what the morality of life is and what it consists of in, in action, of acting upon it. And same with why the looter's code is on the premise of death and why it can only lead to death, because that is actually the, the, the deepest purpose of the mystic, is, is to, to reach a state of death. Um, and similarly, I was thinking, well, maybe you could reduce the, the third part about uh, 
in terms of the choice because it seems fairly obvious. But as we'll see, I think there are reasons there too why he has to go into the level of detail that he does go into um, in that part. So I think that the length is necessary. Anything else? Ed? In her uh, notes that were published, she doesn't have a whole lot of systematic outline of her philosophy. She has you know, sections on volition and section here on some things, but and yet it took her two years to write this speech. So I we conclude she held the whole philosophy in her head and all the connections. Well, it was my, I'm not sure about this, but it was my understanding that the, the, their loss or that, yeah, that, that we just don't have them anymore. Um, I'm not sure about that, but that was, I can't imagine her not, oh, sorry, your own? You want to say? We found some. Oh, really? You found some of the notes, the world speech have been found, not all of them. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine her not uh, having tons of notes on gold speech. Yeah, Harry? She originally wrote the whole speech in hierarchical order. Yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about that. To through it out. From other notes? Or just from her head? I think the stages, I don't know. Early, you know, there are early notes that, that appear later as paragraphs of all speech, so she must have had those. Oh, that's a, I, I, I was going to get into that um, yesterday, but we can take that up now. We have a bit of time. Um, that, that, that's a point made in the journals. Um, I think they're quoting an interview from Ayn Rand that she started the speech off in hierarchical order with metaphysics, epistemology, then getting to ethics, um, basically the structure of OPAR. Uh, but that she switched to, she decided that that was inappropriate for fiction and for Galt's speech, and she switched uh, the order around. And the question I have is what, on what principle or what is the new organizing principle? If it's not um, on, in terms of hierarchy, then what is it in terms of, what is the new structure? What is the, the linchpin, the organizing principle? Does anybody? <laughs> Any suggestions? Sure, in the back. Uh, I, I, I make two. One, that it was a speech, that it wasn't something for people to read and be able to take the time to integrate that it hasn't been presented to people in front of the But she still gets into metaphysics and epistemology. No, no, she gets oh. into it, but she presents it in a way, taking into account that it is just going to be heard and just heard once by the people. So she had to, she had to organize it in a way that they would be able to make the links and keep, keep with Gaul as he was going to his Yeah, I think uh, there's so much to that. But or it would be any good because nobody's, you know, uh, no stenographer is taking it to read the next day. So, so your idea would be that they wouldn't understand if, he, if, if Gaul started with metaphysics, they wouldn't understand why he's talking about metaphysics? Is that the idea that? Well, the principle of it is just like a, 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 any where, where you're doing educating is that you start off and say you got to grab your reader or you got to grab your listener. You, you do it in a way that you just look at the introduction it gets them interested into what else is going to be coming here. So I think that it was, it was the fact that it was going to be heard and the organization of speech is totally different from the organization. Yeah, the I think there's something, yeah, I think that's definitely, there's something to that. But what... Um, what would be the new organization? What would be the new focus of uh, the speech? I mean, what, as I put it, what is the, or, the new organizing principle? Well, I think it's that, um, it, it's the theme of the novel, that the, the new focus of the speech is on um, that the mind is the tool of survival and the full meaning and full implications of that principle. So if you notice um, what I'm calling the start of part one, um, which is on page 120. I think the start is when uh, Galt states, man's mind is his basic tool of survival. And he's going to show um, in part one, when he's talking about the morality of life, he's going to show how that, that the, 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 the moral code of the producers flows from a full understanding and recognition of that basic fact of the, of the fact about man's uh, metaphysically given nature, that reason is his tool of survival. That's going to be the focus. And he's going to, um, as we'll talk about next class, 
I think he gets into metaphysics and epistemology only to the extent that that that, that, that is crucial to fully validating the principle that the mind is the tool of survival. And similarly, when he's uh, discussing the morality of debt, he's going to show, uh, he's, he always comes back to the principle that the mind is the tool of survival, and here negatively, that they're at war with that metaphysically given fact, and so the result is only going to be destruction. And um, in, in uh, part three, when he's telling them to choose, um, part of what he's telling them is to have reverence for all the achievements of man's mind. That they have to fully recognize and appreciate that principle. So I think that, to, to, to put the speech back into the novel and to fully integrate it, she had to make that the kind of organizing, integrating principle of the speech. And so I think that's the new organization. Okay, any questions on that? Well, we have about five minutes left, so we might be able to get into uh, a bit of part one. Let me just get my notes out here. Well, we can I, we can just briefly um, go through the what I'm calling the introduction, and then we'll be ready for part one uh, tomorrow. And as I've said in the, in in the introduction, I think he just um, I mean he he's highlighting there what the the overall structure of the speech will be. So he, he makes the point that uh, what has happened to the world is that the morality, their moral code has been fully achieved. That the morality of death has been fully achieved and so the result is destruction. <clears throat> and then he, he makes the point that, uh, as I've said, that the, the men of the mind are on strike in the name of a different code the moral code of the producers. Um, and he, he's telling people now that they, uh, they need to discover morality and to make a choice. As he puts it um, at the end of part one, uh, sorry, at the end of the introduction, um, he says, this is paragraph 19 on page 120. He says, whatever else they have fought about, he's talking about um, the... Uh, moral code, the so-called moral codes that have been taught um, to, to the people. Whatever else they've fought about, it was against man's mind that all your moralists have stood united. It was man's mind that all their schemes and systems were intended to, destroy, to, to spoil and destroy. Now choose to perish or to learn that the anti-mind is the anti-life. So they're facing now a fundamental choice to either um, continue siding with the anti-mind mystics and looters or to uh, embrace the, the morality of life, which means embracing the principle that the mind is the tool of survival. And so the, the real speech is going to begin with that principle, that the mind is the tool of survival, and then he's going to uh, first explain how morality flows out of that principle um, he's going to connect that principle to deeper issues in philosophy, and then he's going to um, go to the, the specific guidance that the morality of life has to offer. And then when he's done that, he's going to start off with the morality of death to show how it begins, as we'll see. Its very beginning is um, to be at war with the principle, to try to subvert the idea that uh, the mind is potent and your tool of survival. And then he's going to develop what the morality of life has to say. And then he's going to get to their basic choice. Well, we have three minutes left. And I think I don't want to get into part one. It will be too much. So let me just uh, pause for more questions. Anything, anything that I've said in this first lecture? Sure. Yeah, I'll just go back a moment to the uh, uh, the point that you Gary, that you said that Ayn Rand had actually structured this speech according to uh, the philosophical hierarchy. And uh, she obviously changed that, but she didn't think that was the right idea. Now, um, I think I remember uh, Dr. Peacock saying that uh, when he wrote his book, Gopar, he said that originally he structured it with uh, 
Greedy, he did, he did this, presented exactly this. Originally, man was the first chapter because he thought that was the way to reach an audience first. Uh -huh. And then he, he actually structured his book. I think I'm correct in this. The way Ayn Rand originally structured her speech. Certainly his 1976 lecture course on which the book was based, uh, which is the philosophy of objectivism, was called. Um, it starts off with, there's no question more crucial to man than what is man. So he starts off with man's metaphysically given nature and, I mean, views on man's metaphysically given nature. I'm not sure if he started writing the book with that and changed it um, after a first draft or not. But it's certainly not the, if you're trying to present the system of objectivism as a hierarchical system, it's certainly not the starting point uh, to begin at man's nature. But uh, I'm not sure what the exact question is. Well, I, um, I think it's an interesting uh, comparison uh, to try to explain, and I'm not trying to do this, but raising the question, try to explain why Dr. Peacock, in presenting objectivism, started, uh, did it hierarchy, as opposed to Ayn Rand and I guess Kennedy's statement of objectivism didn't do it hierarchy. She started with really yeah, what, I think was, that's... what was directly evident to okay. her audience and, and what would grab her audience, and that is the mess that was around. Right, yeah, yeah, I think that's that that's right. The the, the difference is that Galt's speech is in a work of fiction and it has to be integrated to the, the story and the plot, whereas mm -hmm. Uh, Opar, Dr. Peacock's book, is a non-fiction right. treatise that um, is just to define the, the whole structure of the system. And so what's, what's been demonstrated in the strike is the crucial role of the mind. And so that becomes the, the lead-in to the speech. And so has, it is its organizing principle and the focus of the speech, because that's what has become um, dramatically evident, I mean, perceptually obvious to all the people in the nation. And so th if, if he's telling them now, this is what we're going to set out to understand, the full meaning of this crucial principle, he's got them hooked, given the state of the world. OK, I think uh, we're out of time. So we'll resume on Wednesday.